Most of you will know it as the modest development along Avenue Road north of Bloor, as the structure with the circular windows in Yorkville, as a part of Canadian counterculture, or perhaps you've never noticed it at all. Today we're talking about 33 Avenue Road, a rehabilitated set of Victorian houses that in the late 1960s took the architectural world by storm. A development that's modesty inspired countless urban planners and preservationists and played a pivotal role in Toronto's Yorkville culture of the late 1960s and 1970s. Today we're talking about the history of York Square. York Square was, and is, a modern commercial complex with an open-air courtyard incorporating turn-of-the-century Victorian homes and modernist 1960s structures at the corner of Avenue Road and Yorkville Avenue, right here. The project was designed by the new and talented firm, Diamond & Myers, in mid-1960s, them both having just arrived in the city. At the time, Toronto was focused on urban renewal the destruction and decimation of many of Canada's most prized structures. To many, anything old was passé, unimportant, and a weight holding the city back from modern greatness. But York Square challenged this. Its modesty started a revolution with its ordinariness. The fact that people didn't notice it was the point. York Square was an alternative. It set an important precedent for heritage preservation maintaining existing neighborhood scale and character, and what people refer to as adaptive reuse. Diamond and Meyer's design fitting perfectly in the emerging and influential group of urbanists around the city. Jane Jacobs, John Sewell, Eb Zeidler, Jim Lorimer, and the burgeoning activist culture centered around Yorkville itself. Influential German architectural magazine Bohmeister 69 wrote of York Square in 1972 that City redevelopment often means the death of a city. York Square has taken another course. Instead of using the bulldozer, old buildings have been reshaped and new ones adapted to the three-story scales, resulting in a mixture of urbanity and intimacy, of variability, and the coziness of maple tree courtyards. York Square in many ways led to and inspired preservation, conservancy, and sustainability movements both domestically and foreign. It incorporated older fabrics into the new project, something we take for granted these days. York Square, in many people's minds, was a catalyst. It set a new approach for architecturally marrying new and old in Toronto and around the world. It was an interesting development, garnering accolades, awards, and attention, both near and far. As the Japanese architectural magazine Architecture and Urbanism put in November 1971, Diamond and Myers attempted to take advantage of the patterns created over the years and succeeded in injecting an old area with new life. Comparing the space to Canary Market and Girardelli Square in San Francisco and elements of New York's Greenwich Village, it was clear that York Square was not just a set of buildings. It was an idea. In 1853, the area became the village of Yorkville, before being annexed by the city of Toronto in 1883, changing its name from the village of Yorkville to St. Paul's Ward. By the 1930s, the neighborhood we still call Yorkville was acquiring a bohemian feel. This village feeling continued on, and with it brought the cultural changes of the 1960s. This quaint Victorian neighborhood began a transformation in the early 1960s. The times, they were a-changing. Perhaps, though, a Bob Dylan reference isn't the best choice. Yorkville of the 1960s helped build the careers of Canadian musicians like Buffy St. Marie, Neil Young, Gordon Lightfoot, Joni Mitchell, and countless others. Joni sings about Yorkville in her 1968 song, Night in the City, as does Neil Young in Ambulance Blues, singing about the iconic Riverboat Coffee House. In fact, Buffy St. Marie's song, Universal Soldier, was written here at the Purple Onion Coffee House, a music venue which sat in this space just prior to the redevelopment of York Square. 1960s Yorkville 
was important. It was controversial, inspiring, creative, and influential. The hippie and counterculture movements in Canada were, to a large extent, headquartered in Yorkville and the surrounding neighborhoods. It was a melting pot of anti-war protest, the sexual liberation movement, women's rights, gay rights, literature, poetry, music, and, of course, a growing drug culture. Yorkville was home to it all, and to those looking in at it, this caused a very difficult relationship. Joni Mitchell in 1966 at a Detroit coffee house said that, almost every week there's a column on the entertainment page, Yorkville hippies strike again, that Torontonians are very ashamed of the village until they get away from Toronto and then they say, oh, you must come and see our Yorkville Avenue. It's so much better than yours. But Joni was right on both fronts. There was a lot to be proud of about Yorkville in the 60s. The coffee houses, restaurants, shops, and people were legendary. Music spilled out onto the streets day and night. Where else in Canada could you find Margaret Atwood doing readings at the Bohemian Embassy? Harry Belafonte chatting up Gordon Lightfoot at the riverboat. Neil Young leaving his day job at a Coles bookstore on Young Street to go jam up the street in Yorkville. And coffee. Coffee played a very important role in Yorkville in the 1960s. European entrepreneurs were importing a cafe culture to the city, something akin to the Haight-Ashbury and Greenwich villages of the time. Things were new, including a good number of Americans fleeing the Vietnam War draft and looking for a new home. The rise of 1960s Yorkville can be accredited to numerous factors. With the rise of suburban sprawl, the city had in many ways been emptied out. It was cheaper to live downtown than in Don Mills, and the hippie nature of the area rekindled the cool factor of living in the city again. So, when discussing York Square, we have to put it in this context. When it opened in 1968-69, Yorkville was a countercultural mecca. But the peace and love and art of the mid-60s was starting to fizzle out. York Square to many was viewed as something that helped elongate the magic of the neighborhood. A secret garden of sorts that allowed people to ignore the transition from the summer of love in 1967 to a more contentious phase. The love-ins and sit-ins happening along Yorkville Avenue, down at Queens Park with Leonard Cohen and Buffy St. Marie and others, were bumping up against a skeptical public, an aggressive police presence, and gentrification. York Square to some being part of the latter, to others the former. York Square was designed and built in 1968-69 by the influential Toronto-based partnership of Jack Diamond and Barton Myers. Both men were graduates of the University of Pennsylvania, studying under Louis Kahn and Robert Venturi. Diamond was from South Africa, Myers from the US. Both of them moved to Toronto though and set up a architectural partnership in 1968. York Square was one of their very first projects, showcasing their principles of urban revitalization through the rehabilitation of existing buildings, appropriate infill, low-rise high density, and the creation of humanly scaled, well-designed urban space, while endorsing an outspoken modernist sensibility in form and material. The firm worked on other developments like Eclipse Whitewater, 19 Berryman Street, Innes College, Sherborne Lanes, and others, until the dissolving of their partnership in 1975, before moving on to successful careers independently. Jack Diamond receiving the Officer of the Order of Canada and the Canadian Governor General's Award for Architecture, Myers with a gold medal from the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada and the American Institute of Architects, in addition to many other awards. York Square was completed at the height of the hippie period of Yorkville in 1968-69, its innovative collage of two periods, the Victorian and late modernist pop art, whose dramatic juxtaposition reflected the social ruptures and revolution of the time. The project included the two pairs of Victorian semi-detached houses and three row houses that had first appeared in the Goads Atlas in 1913, here. By 1968, they had already been converted with new shop fronts inserted into their facades facing Avenue Road. Diamond and Myers preserved these four semi-detached houses and included, but completely refaced, the three others to the north. Two semi-detached houses on Yorkville were replaced by a two-story building which stretched around the south, east and north perimeter of the site, enclosing a large open courtyard with two trees at the heart. 
On one side, the backs of the Victorian-style houses face the yard, and on the other, the modern red brick and metal frame glass walls look back. Access to the courtyard is through an open passageway between the house from Avenue Road, as well as an additional covered route from Yorkville Avenue. According to Canadian Architect magazine in 1969, York Square was a focal point, intimate in feeling and related to human scale and vistas. A court where people can meet for coffee, dinner, and where the boutiques work beautifully. In the square, warm brick combines with the white of the older buildings and the stark relief of the fire escapes. Above all, a magnificent tree has been retained. Its branches extending to the eye level of diners on the terrace and in Le Coin. Diamond and Myers received the contract from rookie developer I.R. Wookie. The firm pitched him on a new approach. The architect and developer both agreed to try something new and did. At the time, urban renewal was the trend. Knock it all down. And Toronto, unfortunately, was famous for that. Diamond and Myers and Wookie said no. Let's come at this from a different angle. And what they did served as inspiration for urbanists, architects, and preservationists ever since. Yes, it began with Tick Wookie, who had bought the property and had not been a developer. So both he and we were starting out on a journey that began with York Square. Uh, and we persuaded him not to follow the rules. At the time, uh, there were mandatory setbacks from the street. And if you do that, then you lose the street continuity, you lose the definite of the street, and it becomes suburban. So we said, keep the old buildings, because they're on the street, they provide a continuity, and we'll adapt them. Furthermore, there's a backyard. We'll build in the backyard so that you'll get more accommodation and create a square in which would be perfect for performances, for uh, as an outdoor cafe and so forth. And uh, those were the basic tenets of it. Second thing aspect of it was that those houses were built to a certain domestic scale. They were now being used for retail purposes. And cars were passing at anywhere between 10, 15 miles an hour to 30 and 40 miles an hour. So the question was how to be able to give identity to the retail component. And as a consequence, we figured out those big round windows would give identity to the retail, but also draw attention to them as shop windows, not residential windows. In a way, it was a desecration of the historic building. Um, because it changed the scale, it, the, 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 the this brick wraparound at the ground level had nothing to do with what lay above. So in that respect, it was disrespectful. But it... To many, the larger story was more nuanced. That by Diamond and Myers and Wookie choosing not to tear down the old buildings and instead to incorporate them, they actually were doing far more for heritage in the city than not. As the Japanese architectural magazine Architecture and Urbanism put it in November 1971, the close relation between the plaza and the shops enables a smooth flow of people between these two spaces of different nature. One of the most striking features of York Square was the facade. As was often the case in the 1960s, the older buildings were painted white. In addition, a ground floor red brick skin, which provided a few additional feet of storefront accommodation on Avenue Road, wrapped around a good portion of the buildings. The giant circular windows, clearly inspired by their professor, Louis Kahn, placed along Avenue Road, which to this day are memorable and to some, dated. In 1970, the Ontario Association of Architects awarded it saying that the project was an outstanding example of infusing new life into an old neighborhood. It was a finalist for the Massey Medal for Architecture in 1970, as well as being written about and celebrated in countless domestic and international magazines. But what is it today? Yorkville by the mid-1970s was a very different place. The hippies had left, times had changed, and by 1976 the York Square developer, I.R. Wookie, had built the 60,000 square foot luxury shopping complex, Hazelton Lanes, now named Yorkville Village. This would be enlarged in the 1980s as well as numerous other large building projects, office towers, towering condos, and a constant stream of fancy shops. In many ways, 
the exact opposite of what York Square in Yorkville was in the 1960s. York Square has ebbed and flowed since its heyday. It's no longer a village, and York Square is now drowned out by towers. In 2013, the Wookiee family sold the property. You see, in Toronto, taxes are based on future development value instead of actual use of the property. Having it in its current formation simply made the taxes on the space untenable, leading to its vacancy and upcoming development. Now, as I stand here in 2020, the space is obviously quite different. The vibrancy is gone. The building's falling into disrepair. The bricks are falling apart, but there's still one thing left. The beautiful tree is still here. The future of that tree, we don't know. As a result of public pressure led by the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, ACO, the property was designated under the Ontario Heritage Act in 2014. It cannot be demolished without the permission of council or an appeal to LPAT. This said, developers have been interested in the location of York Square for years. A 2012 proposal saw a 38-story condominium tower completely raising York Square. By 2014, the proposal had decreased in height and incorporated parts of York Square below. A 2016 proposal lowered the height yet again, creating a vertical forest theme for the tower and incorporating parts of York Square below. And as of early 2020, a new proposal being submitted for consideration. A 29-story condominium with no apparent sign of the Diamond and Myers structure at all. Throughout these efforts, the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, Toronto branch, have lobbied to retain some resemblance of the original development. For the original modesty and contextualism of York Square deserves acknowledgement. So, York Square represented the positives coming out of the neighborhood in the 1960s. Originality, imagination, craftsmanship, sustainability, and perhaps, most importantly, community. Its design helped and inspired. It was a new take on a new interpretation of space. York Square was in many ways all that was good about Yorkville and the era. Now, some people will mourn the loss of York Square. Others will argue it lost its magic years ago. But York Square was more than just a set of buildings. It was an idea. An idea that inspired countless urbanists, city planners, architects, musicians, authors, dancers, and humans. It was significant at the time, and what a beautiful thing to celebrate. Thank you.